Well, okay. Yes, this this is not a not, this is not a, this is not Mendes de Rocha. Um, this is, of course, the School of Architecture in Sao Paulo, uh, designed by Villanova Artigas. And uh, Artigas, as the exhibition indicates, was both a very close friend and, and also a, a sort of mentor to Mendes de Rocha. And, uh, and uh, well, basically, Mendes de Rocha began his life in the school as a teacher, as an assistant to Artigas. And the, this is a, also an incredible image. This is 1968. This is one year after the uh, building was finished. And uh, I, there's not another architecture school like that. There are not too many architecture schools of real importance. I mean, architecturally speaking, uh, of recent date, in any case, uh, there's one here, of course, by Alvaro Ziza, and this one by, by Artigas. And, the, and the, uh, the one by Artigas, uh, well, this, this actual photograph is 1968. It, it is uh, the time of the um, so-called worldwide student revolt, really. And, and here we see it in action. And, and what I like about this uh, image is, is, well, of course, the architecture, but also the fact that uh, this is a term of Hannah Arendt, by the way, that this is a space of public appearance, you know, this, that it, it's wrapped around this space of appearance. I, I find that, uh, which were for Arendt, of course, was always uh, a proto-political space, as public buildings w with large spaces inside them tend to be. And, uh, okay. And this is uh, something quite different. It is uh, um, Alfonso Rede. Uh, it is uh, the Museum of Modern Art in Rio de Janeiro. And, and the, uh, actually, Mendes talks about the extent to which uh, uh, the, the Paulista School is indebted to the karaoke school in, in, in uh, Rio. And, and I think the, this extraordinary building, because you know these point supports, the, the whole uh, frame goes down to these point supports, which in their turn support another platform. I mean, th this, um, th this is something that Artigas clearly took from, uh, from uh, Rady, actually. And, and that is, you know, you can see that that kind of idea of uh, a new kind of support uh, is also present in many of the buildings of Mendes del Rocha. Well, this is me, and I'm not quite sure why it's here, because <laughs> I gave this talk, and um, there were sort of mixed up elements. But anyway, this is uh, um, Hans Sharun, in fact, in, uh, in Breslau in, in uh, 1930, I forget exactly, you know, I'm not quite as sharp as Jean-Louis Cohen in, in, in terms of memory, m memorizing exactly the date. I think it's sort of 1936 or something like that. Uh, it's in, and and uh, well, uh, impresses me because of its continuous plastic form. And uh, so some of this is about con uh, the way I uh, originally structured the lecture. Some of this is about con continuous plastic form, which is topographic form. So that the next image, which is this famous uh, sketch of uh, of uh, Le Corbusier of uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, with the idea that that one would expand the city, the very the city hemmed in by uh, by uh, by the by volcanic uh, by mountains, in fact, and and uh, you know with a kind of continuous uh, roadway, which we see again, of course, in the famous Plano Bus of uh, of um, of Luca Algiers, 1930, and. Uh, so the, these kind of remarks, which I should have sort of perhaps taken out of this lecture, uh, have to do with the phenomena of uh, ever-increasing uh, urbanization worldwide, so that this book, published by the London School of Economics, makes the case that, that by the year 2050, which is very close to now, that 75 percent, when, when this uh, book was published, it was 2007, 50% of the world's population live in urbanized regions. And now, you know, it's projected then 
It was projected for 2050, it would be 75%. So uh, I have a whole prologue here that is all about that issue and many other issues as well. So I had forgotten that I have all this kind of stuff. Well, well now I have all the images, why is that? Why do I have all the images? I don't know quite. I don't quite know what to do about it either. Uh, let me go back. No, it doesn't work. Can someone give me a little help here, do you think? I need, I need some help, yes. Mm. Can, you, can you begin at, uh, at that? Ah, yes, terrific. Very good, that's it. All right, finally. I can get rid of the prologue, you'll be happy to hear, and talk about this house. Well, you know, this extraordinary house that was built, well, there are two houses here, one for himself and one for his sister, and um, in Bhutanta. And, uh, well, I, you know, also earlier today, looking at the um, video of the interior of the house, it made one realize what an extraordinary house it is. But, well, I always knew it was an extraordinary house, but the thing I appreciated from the model downstairs and from and from the video is, you know, the importance of the ground, the earthwork, you know, the berm, in fact, that surrounds the house. And, uh, you know, this, this question of topography, again, and uh, the importance of architecture in relation to topography, and also something which uh, Alvaro is, uh, is often talking about the, the I, I think, at some, some point, Alvaro, you said, architecture without nature is meaningless, you know. And I, I, here, you know, of course, it's a, it's, you can say in some sense, it's an artificial nature, this earthwork that is to the right of this section at the top of this image. So that, there are many things to be said about this house. Um, and I, I, you know, one could go on a long time, I think, but, um, when one looks at this plan, for example, uh, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, but what I find extraordinary about the house is the house is a private residence, but it's also emphasizing the public aspects of a private house. So uh, you, when you come up the entry stair, you have this sort of foyer space which runs right across the house, and which is also a kind of public space. And when you, of course, penetrate into the house, you find the wider living room, which is also treated as if it's a public space. So I find this emphasis upon uh, what is strictly private is, a, is the bedrooms, the shower, the bathroom, WC, et cetera, in the core, in the center of the house, top lit. And that's what gives it, I think, this uh, um, very sort of public inflection to a private dwelling. And so you have architecture and nature here, you have public versus private, there are dualisms all over the place. The other thing which, which is very characteristic of Mendes, I think, is that with, with his father as a hydraulics engineer and going to McKenzie University, which uh, em emphasized structure, is that, that's my feeling anyway, that he could, whenever possible, it treats the work of architecture as though it is almost a piece of engineering, that, that, it, that in his hands, engineering and architecture are sort of in some, way, some sense inseparable. And, and uh, I'm, I, well, I'm convinced that this is something to do with his father, but, but what is uh, 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 amazing about this house is that it's standing on four columns, you know, only on four columns, so there is this idea of uh, of structural economy that is built into a lot of his projects. And, uh, uh, and so here is the public space of the living room. The, of course, it's exposed structure. It could be loosely considered as a brutalist work. But then there is this extraordinary in in invention of these spring-loaded uh, windows that, uh, that uh, pop out to ventilate the space and pop out you know, towards, the the, towards nature that is contained within, in the space between the house and the edge of the berm. Uh, and, um, and then, you know, the, the, the private uh, 
faces are, are screened by, by uh, louvers, uh, sliding louvered doors, uh, so that, uh, yes, so these are these extraordinary windows, and, and, uh, and this is one of the columns, of course, uh, uh, supporting downstand beams, which go in both directions to establish. So uh, the, the idea of cantilever is absolutely, this architect can never stop using cantilevers. You know, they, they are crucial in a way to, to his capacity to make work altogether. And uh, so uh, this, this entry, and I noticed that it's amazing because the, the, I think the house is built, the, rather the staircase is built. It's not quite like, that's also revealed downstairs. It's not quite like the, the staircase that was projected. One wonders why exactly. But the, the, the half landing of the staircase, the, the interim landing, was, is much more generous in the project than it would seem in the final work. And that idea of, of expanding the landing, I, it's, 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 it's incredible, I think. So you, here of course is the house furnished. I will not uh, go on it, continue to talk about it endlessly, but um, here of course again, you know, architecture and nature, and uh, one, one more shot of the, now no longer in color, but emphasizing the movement of the windows out, you know. Uh, and, um, and here from the other side, uh, you know, the, the play, in fact, ah, that's a very important part of his work because he plays uh, much more than any other architect I know in this um, dialectic between using light uh, uh, steel in tension against heavyweight concrete. You know, that this it, it occurs much later in his career in the so-called Hooper Tempo building uh, in uh, Sao Paulo. This project, which is shown downstairs, but uh, in some ways um, it's not so easy to understand downstairs. This is the famous Centre Pompidou of 1971. His entry for the composition won, of course, by Renzo Piano and Richard Rogers. And, and if ever there is a building that you, you look at and you think, if this had won instead of, and someone said earlier just now that it, it was awarded the third prize, if this had won instead of the Renzo Piano, Richard Rogers, I mean, the, the whole evolution of uh, European architecture and for that matter, world architecture would have been uh, quite different, I think, you know. Well, of course, the, the whole Anglo-Italian high-tech movement would perhaps not have realized what it was able to realize. But, but um, it, it's anyway to have a totally different character. But, but in terms of engineering, in terms of, you know, this whole crazy large museum is carried on 16 columns. You know, it's, it's a bit like the house, it's carried on four columns. Here we have two rows of eight each, and uh, it, well, with the parking underneath, of course. But it's a bit like a sort of flying saucer in a way that sort of landed, uh, landed in Paris. So it's 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 just as. Um, well, how can I put it? It's just as, in its own quiet way, as futuristic as the winning scheme, you know, in, in some sense, I think. And uh, anyway, it's an extraordinary work. And, and this then is this stadium in, uh, uh, here we are, this stadium in uh, Dorada, um, Dorania, where the, where the important, uh, issue is not to close, well, first of all, it's uh, you know, within the kind of Roman tradition of a Colosseum, but, but to leave a slot, to leave uh, vistas open at the end, so that something of the landscape can be seen from the tribunes inside the building. But for me, the most, uh, and this is the idea, of course, and this is the space as, as realized, I think it's a 60,000 seat Stadium, and uh, what well, unbelievable building, and the, but the most, for me, the most uh, moving thing is this, you know, where this um, 
where the monumentality of the technology, you know, the, the plastic monumentality of the space underneath the dune is also space, you know, made for the human subject. You know, this, I, I find this photograph uh, very evocative and, uh, and, and, and we see more of it here. But the other, uh, uh, the other um, preoccupation, or, or yeah, I think we could say preoccupation, with with uh, Mendes La Rosa, I think, is this question of territoriality, this question of the scale of the American continent, you know, the way in which he was able to imagine and project uh, works which, you know try to come to terms with the scale of the continent itself. So this is actually a port project for the Tiete River, you know, it's a, it's a navigable river within, and I discovered from downstairs, he wrote a whole thesis on navi uh, a little book on nav navigable rivers. So th this is, this, is uh, this idea of territoriality. And, uh, uh, and you see it again here, project done with students, I, by the way, one doesn't know what to make of that, because um, I think it, the text somewhere says this project was done with students, but in, in a way, uh, anyway, towards the end of his career, or maybe halfway through or something, Mendes had such a following of students that the office itself was, was never had permanent staff in it. Well, there was always the same secretary, et cetera, et cetera, I think, but there wasn't, uh, anyway, in the second half of his career, there wasn't a staff in the office. So when, when he got a, a, a commission, he would then gather these, you know, bunch of students around him and form a kind of instant office, which was, uh, you know, uh, yeah. And, uh, well, this is the transformation of the bay in Mont Montevideo. And it shows you the chaos of the kind of megalopolis surrounding the bay as it, as it existed and as it still exists. And his idea was a kind of rationalization of the shores of the bay, simply these two, uh, oh, you don't see it. These, sorry. These two uh, piers are built out into the bay in order to create a kind of Cartesian space. And, and in this space is a little island, and he would talk about this um, island in the most poetic way. He says, uh, a tiny island in which, in the manner of the Venetians, a theater is set up. And he talks about uh, music coming from the island, uh, echoing across the bay. He, he evokes the idea that it's uh, a piece of music by Villa Lobos, uh, Amazonica. It's a very nice piece of writing that. And then I think the other dimension of this man is also at, at a certain moment, this is the Dom Pedro bus station in Sao Paulo. And it also gives you some idea of the, well, you know, Sao Paulo is like a 30 million megalopolis. Uh, and uh, you, can, you can see that this thing is entirely in steel, and I think in glass fiber. And, and it's really a kind of uh, large, expansive piece of industrial design. So he had a capacity to, his, you know, his capacity to work and capacity to express uh, over a very wide range, I think. For a bus station, this is not bad in my opinion. And uh, you see it in action. Carrying an enormous number of people each day into Sao Paulo and out of Sao Paulo. And then the, there is this extraordinary um, uh, patriarchal arch, arc of the patriarch because of the street bearing that name. Um, the Bigotto Char comes across here, 240 million uh, meters long, I think. You know, this is a, it's, it's a part of an overall proposal to revitalized the old center of Sao Paulo, the 19th century center. And um, so the first time one maybe looked at this image, you think that this has to be of concrete, but no, it's not of concrete. 
it's a world of steel and uh, extraordinary, I think, uh, capacity to use material, you know, for particular problems in particular ways. So here you see the viaduct which connects the theater and these uh, pre-existing important buildings. And at the end of it uh, is the, uh, the so-called Ark of the Patriarch, which also, of course, makes a kind of allusion. Now I'm blocked. Why is that? Why can I not get forward anymore? No. Oh, now I've got everything. Yes. All right. It's not advancing. Why is that? Don't ask me. Ah, what? What? Is it? I can't get it to advance. Oh, I see. All right. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. I think I got the technique. All right. Very good. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, actually, there is a video of this space in the exhibition. And, and uh, the way it relates to the movement of people who, who are really, this canopy covers a exit down to a lower level of the city. Well, you see it here quite clearly. And this is this uh, extraordinary Pupo Tempo building, which is in fact a, a municipal a galleria. It combines, typologically speaking, I think a galleria and a bridge. You know, and it's it's a, it's next to um, it's a Cairo, uh, metro station of the uh, public transit, and um, but it, it it is this uh, you know very um, yes noble and and liberated space for for where people you know pay uh, fees and taxes or get uh, pensions or, or all those kind of things. And uh, the, this image shows, particularly the top section, the relationship between reinforced concrete construction and, and, uh, and, and the, the deck, plus this very light, steel, elegant uh, um, structures poised on top of the reinforced concrete. And we, we see it most noticeably here because the whole of this uh, roof structure is this light, uh, very elegant structure poised on top of a concrete bridge, in fact. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's an incredibly, uh, it, ah, yes. Uh, well, it, it, you know, this, this combination of two types, galleria, traditional type, and bridge, and, uh, and then this dialogue between two different materials and techniques, welded steel and, and, uh, and the reinforced concrete. And then he makes this project. Um, the, these are, I, I think it's a work made in 2009 for the, when there's a bid made by the Sao Paulo for the Olympic Games. And, and these are all uh, sites in the region of Sao Paulo, which is like uh, you can see now, if ever you could see, I mean, the kind of continuous megalopolis of Sao Paulo. And then he makes, uh, he spreads the Olympic Games over uh, in relation to a river and introduces these elements like this uh, uh, rowing course, you know, the, that is the kind of mega element introduced in relation to a river or, uh, here, you know, uh, actually uh, housing for uh, uh, the participant in the games. And uh, again, the same thing here, using every occasion that he can to, to reactivate uh, or revitalize or reintegrate the urban uh, mosaic that surrounds it. Uh, here, of course, a stadium. Here, you know, housing for participants, uh, and uh, so on. And uh, yeah, well, I think you get the idea. Um, and then he will do the same thing for Paris. 
And this is a project uh, for Paris that is, uh, comes after the Sao Paulo project, which is a so-called sports boulevard, which is related to the existing uh, Canal Saint Martin, which is, uh, goes uh, at the, as a diagonal here, and, and he creates a kind of area of water coming off the canal, which is actually a marina. And uh, so this is a so-called sports boulevard, which uh, provides, you know, uh, it's a sort of a, a city in miniature for, to receive the Olympic Games of 2012. And uh, Paris loses the bid. London gets the 2012 Olympic Games. And the, then there are, the, towards the end, these, these, uh, this project of Vigo in Spain, a new university where, where the whole thing consists of, uh, of a kind of continuous walkway raised above the, uh, above a kind of undulating side, feeding the different faculties, of course, not built. And we see it again here. Uh, it, it's, it, it's very much related to Gugatti's concept of the the territory of architecture, I think. The, well, the, the universal consensa, which was realized in part, at least, by Gugotti's Sociati design. And, uh, well, the, you know, the services are carried below. That's a cross-section through the uh, continuous uh, bridge-like structure, and more of the same, with the different faculties arranged Which brings one to this um, conversion of, uh, of, um, of an old department store into a um, sesk. Um, you know, the, the earlier sesk uh, produced by, uh, through the designs of Linda Bobadi, where, where she converts an old factory to a kind of, uh, well, it's, it's a, it's a welfare, it's a limited welfare state in a way. It's, it's, a, it's a provision of uh, uh, public facilities for workers in certain, uh, yes, unions really, of, of, uh, of the city of Sao Paulo. And uh, so that the, the beginning, the, the converted department store is uh, in, the in the very middle of the uh, plan that we're looking at here. And, uh, that's the existing uh, uh, structure. And then, you know, he, 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 he builds on the existing, so that again, it's a, uh, it's really carried on four columns, basically, again, like his own house, with a ramp to one side. And uh, so that, uh, yeah, so you see it here, this is a kind of general provision of space, which is sometimes a cafeteria, sometimes a ballroom, uh, sometimes uh, dental offices, um, providing sometimes classrooms, etc., and sometimes, uh, you know, with this, uh, what, what he adds to the whole thing is this kind of uh, uh, bathroom, toilet facility as a freestanding sort of element tacked onto one side, and uh, and then, um, uh, you know, a kind of auditorium. And uh, well, I think you know. This is, I think, this is the cafeteria area, um, and uh, and um, you know, more of the same. I don't know. To be honest, I don't know what everything is, and I've never seen this work also. But it ends, of course, with this incredible uh, pool on top of the building, and. Um, he, he says somewhere when he's asked about this, he says, uh, well, uh, you know, the alternative was to make an inside pool, but I, the inside pool can't be, can't be compared to an outside pool. Uh, outside pool is far preferable. I had, I had in mind the image of Copacabana Beach, for example, you know. And uh, so this is uh, basically what he achieved. And I, I suppose I'm comparing this to the Sesc and now my, uh, the whole discourse leaves uh, in this lecture Mendes de Rocha behind. To, to these two images, of course, is the first, is the buildings that added, that uh, Lina Bobadi added to uh, the uh, factory, disused factory plant in the 70s, 
center of the city. And I, I always thought that these, these buildings were, were, they're not members of the Russian Court. And, and it's a very funny thing that this very powerful woman would, would uh, uh, produce works like this. So much so that uh, I think in, in some ways there is a reference of, of Alvaro to, her, to these strange holes. You, you feel that the, that the building has been bombarded or something. You know. uh, it, it's a curious, surreal uh, way of illuminating what, which in this whole cubic block there are sort of sports facilities. So it's, it's the first Cesc building to which the um, the building I've been talking about is the second. And um, so at this, at this point, this same lecture goes off into uh, Curitiba and the whole uh, designated bus lane system. This Curitiba, which we know nothing about, and of course now the lecture has departed altogether from Men of the Russia. And uh, this is what I gave when John Louis was in New York in April, uh, it was a nice moment. Thank you. <laughs>